Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Open Source in Business. I'm joined today by some uh, very distinguished guests. Ray Paik, Head of Community at KubeDev. Um, Scott McCarty, who's a Senior Principal Product Manager at Red Hat. And Joseph Jacks, who's a Principal and Founder at OSS Capital and the creator and organizer of the Open Core Summit. And we are going to discuss the topic of Open Core um, in all of its nuance and depth and breadth, I hope. Uh, we're going to talk about what Open Core means because there are different definitions floating around there, uh, the origins of the term, um, whether the term continues to be useful, and um, why there's, there's so much negative baggage in certain circles um, around the term. And, and so we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of, of choosing open, open core models for software licensing as a company. And actually, that's, a, that's probably a good place to start uh, by just saying, is open core related to software licensing, related to companies' business models, or something else? Um, Joseph, would you like to get us started on like how you define open core? Sure. Um, I actually don't define open core as a license model or um, anything kind of related to how people define open source, which I think is completely orthogonal and, and something entirely different. Um, but I think open core uh, can be useful when it's looked at as a way of building a technology company. So specifically any kind of technology company, it could be a hardware company, it could be a software company. And the, the way I tend to look at the world basically, which is kind of roughly oversimplified is like there's sort of two types of technology companies. There's ones that ha have uh, an open core, meaning the core essence, the core runtime, the core kind of uh, building blocks um, of that company are you know, sort of like materialized or manifest as an open source technology of some kind. So explicitly open source, which means something very specific. And then the other type of technology company is the opposite where uh, you, the core is closed. So you could say uh, closed core versus open core. Uh, now, when you, when you boil the world down that way and you kind of oversimplify it, it's kind of interesting. Like you, uh, it's actually possible to sort of spot really interesting differences between companies that are either open core or uh, closed core. In terms of open core and what it could be in the context of business models, I actually tend to not think that open core is a business model. I tend to look at it more as just an architectural approach. So uh, in, that, in that lens of open core versus closed core. If you double click into open core companies though, um, almost all of them, the ones that I've studied a lot over the years and the ones that we you know, kind of celebrate and, and create a lot of content around uh, with open core summit, um, implement a wide range of business models, not just one business model. So, uh, you know, they could sell t-shirts and ice cream, they could sell uh, support licenses, they could sell proprietary IP uh, or proprietary licenses around the open source. They could sell a managed cloud service, which is just storage and computing cycles. Uh, you know, they could sell a lot of different types of things. And typically, uh, business models, meaning you know what, what you're charging money for in exchange for something of value, um, can be implemented in parallel. So you could have multiple ways of charging money for things inside of an open core kind of company. One common example of this is software companies that sell a managed service or a cloud offering, and then they also serve customers on-prem or sort of behind the firewall or you know, in physical VPCs or physical data centers where they're actually shipping license keys and actually selling software. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it at a, at, a, at a high level. Okay. That's a pretty broad definition because what you've done is define closed core companies as people with proprietary core technology and open core companies as all other companies that have an open source project at the, at the core of their, their technology. Um, so, would you, for example, categorize Red Hat as an open core company? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so that is a very different definition to the one that I would use, and I think uh, probably the one that Scott would use. Given so, Scott, you wrote a blog post recently on open core, which um, kind of makes that distinction a little bit differently. Would you? What? What's your? How would you characterize open core in comparison to what Joseph just? Define yeah, it's thing. interesting. I, I mean, being transparent too, I mean, Joseph and I have had these talks in the past and to be honest, it, it influenced my thoughts on this a lot. Um, I would, I, I view it now actually more in the context of, uh, well, let me say this first. 
I don't ag- disagree with anything tautologically with what Joseph said at all. Like, I actually agree with all of those things. I just don't think I would put those two labels from like a linguistic perspective on those. But I, I think I agree with all of that. I think all of those are true. Like nothing he said was untrue in my mind. Um, that said, I also think open core is like, yeah, I kind of have to double click one step down to like understand what it is. It's a 201 level concept, not a 101 level concept in my kind of definition in that it's like, it's around the value creation and capture, right? Like, so if you, to me, open core is pretty simple. It's using a proprietary license to capture value in a business, whatever business model doesn't matter. It's kind of arbitrary, but, but I will say, I think using open source, using some proprietary code that depends on open source code and using that license to capture value is essentially how I define it, which is a little bit more going back to like 2008 ish or whatever, like sugar CRM. I remember using that back in the day and thinking, okay, now I understand what open core is. Ah, I mean like, like irritated when you couldn't like download plugins to me, that's kind of how I define open core. Yeah. And that would, that would have been where I would have gone as well as like the sugar CRM example is a good one, or maybe, uh, you know, open contrail from Juniper is another one that comes to mind where the open source project exists, but the open source version of it is not really usable for any serious work. And so that's a kind of an open core as a teaser. And then um, you're basically, if you want to deploy this for anything serious, you would you would have to pay for a license fee. And it's, it's one of the things I think, um, Ray, you used to be until recently a, a product, um, c- head of community for GitLab. And I think GitLab is one of those companies that has a really interesting approach. And I'm not sure if I would characterize GitLab as open core or not from my definition. But I'm curious, like, because it certainly um, uh, it, it certainly calls itself. I mean, the, 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 uh, this leadership of GitLab will call GitLab an open core company. Um, can you explain exactly how GitLab navigates that line of where you see the kind of the boundary between open core and and just being an open source company? Yeah, I mean, actually, open core is a term like I didn't wasn't really exposed to until I joined GitLab, probably like in 2018. Um, and that was actually a term that was widely used uh, within the company and within the community. And the way it works at GitLab, I mean, and it, it's it's pretty similar to the way you know uh, that was discussed. Like they have a community edition, which is completely open source. And they have an enterprise edition, which is under a proprietary license that you have to pay for. And uh, uh, but I mean, having said that, I mean, I think even like w- with the companies that do open core, uh, like GitLab, there is a degree of difference. Uh, there are certain companies that have I mean, similar community versus like enterprise editions that you have to pay for. Uh, not only are the licenses different, but the access to the source code, for example, like GitLab, the source code is completely open. I mean, you can go, you know, look under the hood. And if you want to make a contribution, even without a proprietary, like a, uh, even without an enterprise license, uh, we actually gotten decent amount of contributions from the community. But I know there are companies where the source code is maybe gets dropped every time there's a release and you get to see it. But, you know, so people are not necessarily welcome to contribute to it. So there's there's a degree of difference, but uh, I mean, I think the only thing that made GitLab not truly open source was that licensing for the enterprise edition. Because I mean, I mean, I don't know how much that dissuaded people from contributing because it's not a true open source, it's a proprietary license, but I, I think that's the only thing that sort of distinguished GitLab from uh, maybe what people will consider a true open source project. Yeah, I think that distinction between community community and edition and enterprise edition was very very common maybe a decade ago around 2010 yeah. and has uh, has waned in popularity. Um, right. But one of the things that's really interesting about uh, GitLab is it's uh, it has its book right. It describes how the company works, and one of the pages I came across was uh, our what is it our. Um, stewardship of the project and there's a even a section that says if a community member were to submit a patch for or submit a, a, a feature proposal for something that we currently charge for in our enterprise edition how would we evaluate that and it has like a 12 point list of how how things would be evaluated i will note that and this is one of the things that's kind of common to open core projects in general 
I will not. And I, again, I'm using open core projects rather than open core companies. So, so it's I'm even internally not being consistent in the terminology here, which is. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's common is that there are not very many contributions from community members, certainly in areas that are competing with with the enterprise edition. Um, the the GitLab page that I mentioned mentions two examples, and one of them was basically a derivative of the enterprise edition source code. Uh, the other one was not uh, particularly high quality. Um, is that, Joseph, something in your experience that's common to companies that, that are open source company, open core companies, that, uh, that the, the projects that they base their business model on don't get a lot of outside uh, contributions or outside engagement from, from like developer communities or other vendors? No, I don't think that that's true at all, actually. I would also um, strongly disagree with something you mentioned earlier, Dave, which is that the open core projects, as you would classify them, uh, are not, um, uh, you know, to be viewed as sort of serious enough, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of quality uh, to be used in you know, any kind of scenario and they're sort of limited. This goes back to sort of a narrative uh, in the early uh, you know, days of this term being coined where uh, open core is viewed as sort of crippleware and the core uh, open, uh, open source project that uh, was a sort of community edition as you um, uh, described uh, was viewed in a pejorative or a negative or a diminutive sense. Uh, and then the enterprise version was really where it's sort of like all the goodness was, and that's kind of where all the best activity was. I actually think this is a completely false narrative um, and completely baseless. Um, and and I, I do believe it largely comes from, uh, uh, you know, uh, two camps primarily. And I, I, I would say, I think that it's a very loud minority of the overall tech industry. One camp is largely from, from, uh, from, from Red Hat, but unfortunately, uh, even though I, I, I love and respect uh, everyone at Red Hat and good friends with, um, you know, Bob Young, the co-founder of Red Hat and, you know, uh, nothing but respect for Red Hat. I think the other camp it comes from is people who, uh, which is a slightly adjacent community, are very hardcore, staunch, free software, um, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, believers and evangelists and free software specifically. Uh, referring to the origins of open source, so sort of the Richard Stallman school of thought around how uh, you know free software is um, very much about uh, uh, granting one uh, freedom uh, over uh, sort of uh, uh, the more modern um, understanding of open source, which is more uh, around a pragmatic kind of capability. So personal freedom and rights versus you know, you can do this uh, in order to achieve some productivity and, and you know, uh, leverage and efficiency, which is really the sort of open source brand. Um, so and, and, and there's a lot of nuance to that. I'll go to what you asked me specifically around, uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, point of view that I have around contribution and activity with open core projects. Um, so I do not see that specifically. And I, I, would, I would give you a few examples of projects and communities where the opposite is true. Um, one would be, frankly, GitLab. Um, I, I think the community edition of GitLab is where the vast majority of the adoption and the value creation has been driven for uh, people who use GitLab and benefit from the core open source GitLab technology, uh, who do not ever pay Git, GitLab, the company, uh, a single dollar uh, for the value that they get from, from, from that technology. Uh, I think another good example would be uh, HashiCorp. Um, HashiCorp's projects are used uh, by millions of people, and the vast majority of those people do not pay HashiCorp uh, any any money at all. Uh, and I think also there's a large contributor graph of non-HashiCorp employees who uh, very actively contribute to those open source projects. And um, you know sometimes there's a bit of um, tension with, you know, you have a product manager come in. So I'll give you a very specific example uh, with the, the Vault um, project, which is a, a key secrets management database uh, built by HashiCorp, one of their early open source projects. Um, you know, occasionally you'll see a product manager from HashiCorp, uh, you know, jump into uh, 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 an issue or 
feature request that comes up from the community for something in the uh, you know community edition open source vault uh, project that basically is competing or is in conflict with a proprietary feature that people pay money for, like some some specific encryption algorithm, for example. And this has come up more than once. And I think you know the companies that manage that the best uh, are are kind of maybe those two examples. Like I, you know, I give you a bunch more examples, and maybe maybe I will just very briefly, just to not belabor the point. But companies that manage those interactions the best are ones that have high levels of transparency. And expectation setting is just, you know, very, very thorough uh, with respect to how decisions are made and how energy is applied uh, across those two domains, product development and open source project development, which are two completely different things. Um, companies that go and have open source handbooks and um, are really transparent about all the, the driving factors and reasons for making those decisions, um, I think build uh, higher levels of loyalty and trust with the community. Uh, they engender, um, you know, a lot, a lot more engagement from people who would like to participate through the open source community or through partnership uh, uh, dimensions, what have you. And I think GitLab and HashiCorp are really great examples of companies that do that do that really well. Other examples of companies that have community edition, enterprise edition type dynamics, where there's a large contributor graph of non, you know, open core company participants. Um, as well as very vibrant open source communities are companies like Confluent with the Apache Kafka project as their open source core, uh, companies like Databricks with the Apache Spark uh, project as their open source core. Um, you know, you could say, I don't know, um, trying to think of a few others here. Th those four companies, HashiCorp, GitLab, Confluent, and um, uh, Databricks are, I think, all 10 plus billion dollar companies. Uh, that do very well for their commercial stakeholders, their customers, and they also invest a lot in the open source communities. And those open source communities are quite large and vibrant. And in fact, I think there are dozens of companies that build products and services around those open source uh, technologies. Um, and so, I think that that's kind of how I would how I would make the 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 the, the distinction. Um, it does uh, still. Uh, drive a lot of polarity and mm -hmm. argument in the community. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, from my observation, uh, it, you know, in point of view, I think largely the tension is from people who have uh, much, much more philosophically heated kind of points of view uh, that go back to the early kind of free software days. Well, I yeah, think, and the, uh, I mean, yeah, sorry. Before, before I let um, yeah. Ray jump in, I, yeah. I think part of it is also because of you know, the origins of the open core term. And I, I'd love to talk about kind of that second half of the 2000s decade and the beginning of this decade about some of the, um, you know, some of the reasons why open core was coined in the first place, as, as far as I understand it. And, um, you know, some of the collateral damage uh, that was done to the open source brand uh, through that, through that. But, um, Sorry, Ray, you were going to jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to also tag on the amount of contributions from within the company and outside of the company, whether it's HashiCorp or or, or GitLab or others. Um, I don't think it's a problem. Like most of the contributions, merge requests or PRs are coming from the employees. Because, I mean, it's been a, um, like a little over a year since I left GitLab, so I don't know what the headcount is. They had like five or 600 engineers. And of course, there's going to be more work done by the employees who are getting paid to do this. For and sure. if you think about the community yeah. members, on a good week, maybe they can dedicate two to three hours a week. And asking anything beyond that is probably really pushing it, right? Unless they're really passionate about fixing an issue or adding a feature. And you know, I don't I don't think it's really problematic as long as there's a healthy community from outside of the company that are that can participate in in product development or collaboration in a in an open matter i'm not as worried about like what whatever percentage comes from community versus the employees um right. and so I, I just wanted to like point that out because you'll see that for a lot of companies that are leading open source projects that are basically single base company led open source projects right so you, i don't yeah so go ahead scott so. you do see that a lot but that's actually yeah. where i do start to disagree so like i yeah. think 
I think it, when I talk about value creation, I think of it, especially in an open source context, in like sort of four main primitives around bug reports, which basically indicates usage, docs, which indicates, you know, again, usage, code, which contribution, which indicates contributors that actually have a technical background that can, and then roadmap direction, right? Like those are sort of the four places where value creation can come. If it's a single vendor project, every dollar you spend on code is essentially a dollar return in value. Whereas, so, so like you look at a GitLab, you look at a, a HashiCore, one of those, if it's 95% contributions from HashiCore, then they're paying a dollar for dollar for 95% of the code in that, in, that, in that project. Whereas if you look at something like Kubernetes or the Linux kernel, where it's truly a diverse community from a bunch of different vendors, not just community contributions as in like individuals, which I agree with you, everything you said, I just think it misses that like Intel and Google and Red Hat and like all of these big players come together and start to contribute. Now I contribute a dollar in engineering and I'm getting back like five, 10, 30, $50 worth of, you know, value creation in that project, which is a very different animal than like dollar for dollar. So now 95% of the value I'm getting is actually from everybody else. And I'm getting way more value created for every dollar I spent. Now, I think code is where we think of when we say open source, but I will admit that bug reports, docs, roadmap, those are the other key pieces that kind of create a piece of software that's actually usable and consumable. I think that's the difference in my mind. Like you look at an Apache Kafka, that's interesting. You look at like a Kubernetes, there's all kinds of companies forming around Kubernetes that are using an open source technology. I, I will admit, I think it's an arbitrary distinction that, that, open core can't work and i agree that the pejorative is not necessarily fair uh, but i will admit that i think in general showing like one example that can thread the needle which is the only one i'd actually agree out of that is HashiCore threaded the needle really well um other than that you're you're like you're saying it's an anti-pattern that like one company pulled off right and you're like, oh, like i don't know if that's i don't i don't think it's an i don't think it's an anti-pattern that one that one company pulled off i, I think that there are dozens of companies that are quite large and successful at this point that that have implemented some variation of again i was looking at karsten's comment in the the chat he's kind of saying just so that the audience can 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 um parse this uh uh you know is this open core term kind of co-opting or evolving from the past um is open source orthogonal to open core that seems like a clue i would agree with that um, I think that there are dozens of companies that uh, basically build businesses around open source projects, and uh, I think it's I, I think one one key to thinking critically about how these companies operate is uh, to be really careful about conflating things. And I think this is actually something that, independent of Open Core completely, the open source community actually does quite a lot. Um, so there's this log4j exploit, you know, which is all over the news. Um, the biggest thing I think that the open source community conflates is uh, uh, expectation rights. In just the most concise way, I would put it as expectation rights. Um, a huge source of, you know, vitriol and pain and suffering and annoyance in the open source community is that uh, maintainers, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, constantly get up in arms over uh, the users' expectations that they should deliver some amount of work, uh, period, right? And, um, you know, that's just completely false. Open source is not uh, an expectation, uh, you know, uh, setting framework. Uh, it's a licensing, uh, it's a licensing model largely it might be a couple of other things but it's just really a licensing model and the licensing model says uh, that you're granting the software set of rights uh, it's not saying that you're granting the user a set of expectations uh, or, or in fact it's certainly not saying that you're granting the maintainer um, a set of expectations uh, i think you'd get violent agreement from all of us on that one yeah there, there, in fact there are no expectations to be set on either end of the spectrum from the creator maintainer contributor side of the fence, nor from the end user consumer side of the fence. The only thing that open source says is you're getting this technology as is with no guarantees uh, for anything. Um, and so I think the biggest pain point uh, that I that I feel exists in both the open core community, which is a, a, you know, a, a lot of improvement 
in constant evolution and, and, and iteration is happening here. And I, I don't think we've reached any kind of end state, um, which is the same for the open source community is that people just need to realize when you don't set expectations explicitly and clearly, um, what will absolutely always continuously be guaranteed to happen is people will misunderstand and reach the wrong conclusions as to the expectations that they should have. Uh, and as a consequence, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically hold views that are incorrect. Uh, and then those views that are held incorrectly will serve to cause all kinds of stress and frustration. So um, I don't know, that's just generally how, how I see things. So you remind, I have to share this story because there was a guy, I became friends with him a little bit back in the day in the Python community named Zed Shaw, and he was one of the original oh, writers. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Zed was pretty cool. It was super cool. And back then, I didn't know nearly as much about this as he did. He had experienced a lot of these painful things like that himself that back in the day. In fact, the originally why he stopped working on Mongo, at least the story he shared with me, was was it was very painful because people would come and blame him for things. And he's like, I never guaranteed that this would work. And two, I think it was released under like an Apache license or a BSD license. And so there was attribution, but there was no code. And so these other vendors would pick up his code, deliver it in their products, and then say, and then like behind the scenes, kind of blame him for the performance or problems with it. And they'd be like, oh, it's because that Zed Shaw guy wrote this thing wrong. And he's like, what the hell? He's like, why would I? He's like, he's like, yeah, I can't even look at the code of what you published because you never published it, but yet you're blaming it on me. So they had like, it was a uh, non repudiation problem, almost like email. You're like, oh, I sent this email, but they're like, I didn't get it. Um, and so he couldn't even see the code. And so he, he made an argument at that time. This is probably about maybe 2005 ish around that time. He said, he said, I will never release anything other than GPL code again for the rest of my life, because if wow. somebody's going to blame me for something, they're going to have to show the code and then show me how it was my fault, not their fault. And I thought that was a really interesting, like I had never, ever in my entire life thought about that problem, you know, sort of the non repudiation problem. But yeah, so, open source is painful. So, I mean, I mean, I have a question. Maybe this is going to sound flippant or or I mean, I don't I don't mean it that way, but. I mean, I feel like a lot of us like that are that have been in open source for a long time or that are working in, in, in Silicon Valley can get worked up about terminology on like open core or or even cost, right? But from a consumer perspective or even from community members, I mean, do they really I mean, I don't know if they get as worked up as we do about it. Like who cares, right? I don't think people um, should have a reason to care either. No. No, from the I mean, from that, the yeah, so and from the user just, standpoint, standpoint of open source, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I don't think people it should feels care. Like, yeah, I mean, sometimes it feels like we, like, like four of us or other people like us, get worked up about this, and then, but you know, as as long as community members see the value in software and the users do, like, yeah, I don't know if like ninety percent of people even care about the license. Right? Well, I mean, as, I mean, as, I I actually yeah. disagree with you. Well, I I mostly disagree with you both. Um, yeah. And that's because if you go back to the very origin of why was the phrase open source created? Well, it was because there was some ambiguity around freedom and free software. And initially, actually, the, the Richard Stallman and, and the FSF were involved in, in some of those discussions about finding another term to avoid that ambiguity. And it was only after the term open source was finalized that um, that, that um, RMS kind of turned his back on that phrase and said, well, actually, you know, we need to keep talking about user freedom. Um, but one of the things that Open Core represented, in my mind, back in those early 2004, 2005, 2006 days, um, was an erosion of the value of the open source brand. Because open source at that time, for me, still meant this is about user freedom. This is about a set of rights that you are getting as a user of this software. And in many ways, um, Open Core companies at the time were very much uh, the um, uh, the type of, of company and the type of product that uh, Joseph you referred to as as kind of you know being pejorative, um, that not being pejorative, but that the the projects were deliberately um, under resourced, under uh, funded, um, uh, didn't have a lot of the features that were expected. I mean, Sugar CRM that uh, Scott mentioned earlier is, is a really good example of that. And there are others. Um, and so from that period, uh, the, the idea that, you know, open core 
companies were creating these projects that were actually single vendor projects. They were using licensing or other tools to prevent other people from competing with them by building products on top of those projects. And it was really difficult to argue that those were healthy and good open source projects. And as a result, you know, the only thing that we have in open source projects is often our brand. And as a result, that was, you know, relatively early in the in the in the life of the, the open source brand. It really felt to me at the time like that was a, a, a serious erosion of the value of the open source brand. And so that's one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of baggage from that period. Um, yeah, but 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 for the I mean, like I'm going back to my question and I, I obviously care about open source, too. We've been working for a long time, but for for people like me that are in open source, that might be important. But the consumer of the software, like, I mean, I, I don't think that orthodoxy really matters to them a whole lot. As long as the software delivers value, they can collaborate, you know, openly with, with the rest of the company or the community. I think those are the key things. And I mean, this, I mean, that's why, like, I, I sometimes wonder if this open core terminology is even helpful, or like, it's just creating more confusion than than anything else. Because I mean, I, I think I mentioned this in, in my comment in the blog post too, to, to Scott. I mean, my new employer, KubeDev, we have an open source software uh, that everybody has access to, but we also have a cloud-based offering and not all the IPs for the cloud-based offering is is open, obviously, right? But so are we considered open core or not? I mean, that's something actually I, I talk to, you know, our founders about, and I'm not sure if it, if it does it matter or like, so that, See, there's there's a lot of gray area, right? So, but I don't know if it's important to say we're considered open core, open source, or or something else. Right? So oh, like, oh, like if you look yeah. at, oh, oh, sorry, go for it, Scott. Go for it, I was just say if you look at like something like I looked this up with Matt Say the other day. We were chatting on Twitter back and forth, and yeah. like a Gatsby, like they're kind of like an online. Uh, I think it's like a like basically almost like a WordPress type, you know, content management thing. And it's fully open source, but they do charge for their cloud model like you. And I, and I agree. I think that's totally... I, okay, let me say this. I don't think open core is unethical in any way, shape, or form. That's what I wanted to get to. I also don't think charging for a cloud service, even if there is some proprietary glue code in there, is unethical in any way, shape, or form. I think value capture is value capture. And it's fine. The only argument I have is, is that I think in most cases, it's unnecessary. Like if you look at something like the reason why I say it's an anti-pattern is I don't know that it creates any value and I, I'm not even sure it actually helps capture value. I think it's a perceived, it's kind of like a person like hiding a gun in their bedroom and, you know, feeling safer. It's like, okay, maybe you're saying, I don't know, like, has your house ever been robbed? Did somebody steal that code and you needed to like stop them from doing it? Like, I, I just think most of the time, if you actually outrun the, the customer and you create more value, it's easy to capture value if you're creating enough value. So like, it looks like a Gatsby is not having any problem growing. I looked at their list. They have like a ton of people working there now and, and they're growing fine. And it looks like it's a totally healthy business from the outside. I don't know, but it appears to be very healthy and it's all open source and, and yours too. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't realize that uh, you guys, you, you called it open core. I wouldn't call cloud. No, no, I mean, we don't, we, we definitely call ourselves open core. I mean, we, that's actually the discussion I had when I joined, you know, a, about a year ago, uh, because the question was, should we use that term? And, you know, we consider ourselves, no, you know what, this, we're just offering a cloud-based, I mean, the product wasn't out at the time, but uh, we didn't feel awkward calling ourselves like open source. And actually the, the point that, that I forget who it was, somebody made was that the open core term is so loaded, like we probably don't want to go there anyway. So it's what's one of the comments that was made as well. Uh, so, I mean, if somebody calls us open source versus open core, personally, I don't think it'll bother me one way or the other. Like, I mean, it's like some people get worked up about their job title. Like, I'm, I'm not one of them. So I don't, I don't really get worked up about labels in general. But yeah, I mean, like, that was sort of an academic discussion we had internally. But me personally, I don't, I don't think it'll affect what we do one way or the other if somebody calls us open core versus but it open could source, affect so. it could affect yeah. whether con contributors come and contribute to your project because if they know that the only way they can create value for themselves because let's be honest yeah. every individual is also selfish and they're looking to create yeah. value and capture some of it if i contribute to an open source project where i can like now go take that work and work at a different company work on the same thing and capture value over there and 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 you can actually get a the bigger one to me is getting another vendor to contribute. So now there's two vendors competing with each other, building off the same technology. 
that's when it's truly sort of full blossom open source, in my opinion. So, so, so you could get that if you guys are open source. Somebody else could build a better cloud offering and run it better than you, and that's yeah. fine, right? Or more importantly, your customers could protect themselves by paying Tata or HPE or any kind of enterprise services company to come in and manage it for them if you make them mad. And so that freedom does change truly open source from open core licensing, surely, because because if you if you have any of the code that is used needed for a business use case proprietary they have to go rewrite all that code themselves that's a very different level of lock-in than just paying a third-party consultancy to like run the code for them and like get mad at red hat for example um i think that still matters to a lot of enterprise customers i i don't think that's valueless joseph jump in here you uh, i'll say a couple things one is i i think um open source means something very specific and I don't think it's like necessarily sacred and religious as as a as a as a way of thinking about it. But I, I do think it's it's important to understand open source does mean something technically specific. And I think that it's also useful in a completely orthogonal sense to view open core as also meaning something very specific. But they both mean very different things. I would propose open source means something very specific in terms of you know, largely how the OSI defines open source, which is that there's a set of licenses that adhere to a certain set of rights that if those rights are adhered to a, a given set of licenses is viewed as open source. Fundamentally, whether you view it from the free software camp or the open source camp, open source means uh, discrimination free rights to view, modify, edit, and distribute the technology uh, at any time from anyone. You could be a terrorist or you could be a person that is doing only good things in the world. That's what open source is fundamentally right? From like a physics standpoint. I think it's also very valuable to look at open core from the same lens. Although technically not completely yeah. true. There are export controls on cryptography, even if it's open source in the United that's, States. That's I've had to go through. That's true. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that, but that's, I mean, it's, 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 it's generally speaking, I think generally true, hundred percent. Yeah. On the open core side of things, I actually think it would be actually very useful to take a similar lens and go and say, this is not about morality or ethics, open core companies, so specifically the open core term, I think is only useful when applied to companies, not to technologies, not, not to projects, but to companies, specifically perhaps only for-profit companies. Maybe we can even further define that. And uh, in that context, I think the open core term can be viewed as something that means something very specific at a technical level, which is that open core companies have a core that is open source, which goes back to the first phrase that means something very specific. And that uh, core is defined as basically the fundamental ingredients and the runtime and the, the essence that makes up that company, the heart and soul of the company, if you will. Not some crippleware, uh, not some you know uh, a very minimal thing that only lets you do 0.1% of what the company wants, wants, you, wants you to do and wants to enable, uh, but something that largely uh, is valuable to you know 99 plus percent of, of end users and people who could benefit from that technology and in fact is delivering a huge amount of value that's the abstract way that i look at open core and i think it's actually technically very defensible i've spent you know i i, I like to think that half of the last decade of my life hasn't been spent in a waste uh, uh, but i think that and i've studied probably more than most people probably more than more than anyone, at least in the last five or so years that I know these companies. And I think that it's easy to sort of define them really precisely. Like they are very different companies that are open core that have this kind of ab abstract definitional essence that I was describing. They're very different. They operate differently. They hire people differently. Their business models work differently. They evolve products differently. They go to market differently. Their cultures look different uh, societally, the way they interact with the, the, the stakeholders in their ecosystems. Uh, it looks very different as compared to closed core companies. So specifically that distinction. So so that's just kind of how I look you at it. You would argue Snowflake has a very different culture internally than any of the companies in your portfolio. And you would argue that that no matter what their business model, there's something fundamentally different and better about open core companies. The, the challenge I would have with that is I'd ask I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that. Actually, I would not argue that. I would inter interrupt you. I would not argue the two statements that you just mentioned. One, as you said, in my portfolio, I do actually have an investment portfolio. That would be saying something specific. 
Okay. Uh, my, my comments thus far in this conversation have been more or in the broad, portfolio track I, I uh, covering all companies. Uh, the second thing would be, uh, I would never make a qualitative distinction. Uh, I would never say better or worse or morally superior or inferior. Uh, I think that that is completely so then useless. What's special then? What does special mean in that context? If it's not uh, actually, I wouldn't say special either. I would just say different. Uh, they're very different companies. So when, when we, we just like in computer science and programming, when we have a sufficiently complex set of conditions, we have to create a new abstraction. Um, so what would be different between these companies and Snowflake? Like I'm, I'm trying to understand because I think all modern companies adhere to what you're saying for the most part. All modern companies adhere to what specifically? To being open and having open. I mean, like what? What is like literally? What is different between? Give me an example. Company like uh, I don't know, Confluence and Snowflake. What would be the difference between those companies fundamentally? Since one is open core and one is open, not open core. All right, I think it's like super simple uh, to use those two examples. Um, the core of Confluent is an open source technology called Kafka. The core of Snowflake is a proprietary technology that they've built using I don't know, hundreds or thousands of open source technologies, but that they compile as a proprietary service. And that is only accessible and usable uh, if you give them some of your data and sign up for a free plan, or if you pay them money. Um, that is the fundamental physics difference. With Confluent, you do not need to either give Confluent money or any of your data in order to receive a measurable value from their core technology, which is called Apache Kafka. That's the fundamental difference. It's like- So it's once you buy their product that is open, that has a different proprietary license, aren't you in the exact same boat? And isn't the cultures internally at both of those companies probably um, yeah, fairly similar? I, 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 would, I would disagree. You have, you have to step back and go even further. Um, Confluent, the company itself, would actually not fundamentally exist or have a reason to exist without the coexistence of the Apache Kafka project. So if you were to say, all of a sudden, delete Apache Kafka from existence, um, Confluent, the corporation, now $20 billion fully diluted public company, would cease to exist instantaneously. Um, that's the fundamental difference. So I'm curious, um, Joseph, you, you probably more than anyone else in the world right now have, you know, you created an event, Open Core Summit. And, and so you have a certain investment in the open core brand, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, this is something that you've talked about for a long time. Um, can you share what your perception is of, you know, what is the value of open core as a label? I think it's a distinctive label. I think it's very valuable to denote companies that have a fundamental difference compared to to other companies. It's, I think it's pretty simple. It's, it's kind of like saying uh, you're for profit versus nonprofit. Uh, you can fluidly evolve between the two. You can just you can wake up one day and you could decide to be for profit uh, and change the you know the bylaws and the and the, the you know the kind of the corporate structure. Uh, you could do the same in reverse. Um, but I think it's just important as a, a distinctive term to sort of say this is something that's different from something else and it's sufficiently different. I also think that um, but this sounds arbitrary, but particular, not you, you just said not better or worse. So then why do it if it's not better or worse? I don't I'm still struggling to understand the value there. Like um, you said, it's valuable, but you said it's not better. So like I'm like, uh, I'm, my brain hurts. I, I do. I do personally believe it's better, um, but I don't actually think that that's a useful question. And, and, and I'll explain why. Um, most things that we benefit from as humans, uh, if only viewed as a better or worse, uh, would not uh, permeate and be distributed as you know fundamental improving technologies for our lives. Most technologies are neither good or bad; they just are, um, like fire and you know um, you know many other things that, that that we were able to harness and discover as as, as humans. Um, uh, however, I think going back to something that we were talking about much early on, I think that when we discover things that are sufficiently different, that that uh, that are that are um, uh, kind of qualitatively and, and or quantitatively essentially different than things we already understand, we give them new terms, we create new language, we create new words, 
Um, I'm not saying the term open core is perfect. <laughs> I think English as a language, Latin, all of the derivatives of human language that we've invented are blunt force, horribly coarse instruments to express what's happening in our brains to another human being. Um, uh, I think computers are a lot more precise. That's why I think we're all, we're all into computers and maybe we're all programmers and we love computers. Uh, that's maybe one thing that you know, unites all of us. Uh, I do think that, that human language is actually uh, horribly insufficient for actually describing you know, deep, subtle nuances. Um, but as far as I'm convinced today, open core is actually a really valuable term in the context of describing and expressing the differences between one type of company versus another type of company. By the same token, I think the term open source, which I believe is way more heavily uh, 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 you know, polarizing and fully loaded than the term open core at a much broader level, is still actually extremely valuable to describe the differences between one piece of technology, closed source, versus another piece of technology that is open source. Um, so I just I, that, that's kind of roughly how I look at it. So, so, I mean, it sounds like, Joseph, I mean, I, hopefully I'm not putting words into your mouth. I mean, your comparison you're making is between open core versus closed core, not necessarily between open core versus open source. Yeah, that's, I, that, think that's yeah, yeah. I think that's very important to point out. What you just said right. Ray, is really valuable. Something yeah. I wanted to mention earlier, because we're, we're talking about a lot of different things and kind of like interweaving. And it's, these are very complex conversations, mm -hmm. but I would right. never conflate or compare open core with open source. Those are two completely different phrases. Um, I think one thing that is often uh, concluded uh, is that open core is um, endeavoring to replace the term open source in some way. And, and I think this is just a sad kind of consequence of uh, the fact that the terms sound the same when you say them quickly. Open core, open source, open source, open core. Like they become interchangeable, and then you forget. Like, oh wait, these are actually very different things. Yeah, I think so I've heard so I've heard mom, my mom's you know say something like that at one point. <laughs> yeah. So, but but that's a really good point, Ray. I mean, I I think open source means something like super specific. Um, uh, you know, if if you so I'm I'm kind of like a venture capitalist. If you compare like my points of view on open source to like most other venture capitalists, I, I have a very different point of view. Uh, that is actually much more philosophically uh, grounded in, in, in terms of like the origins of open source and free software. When you look at open core, what I think a lot of other VCs do is they would go and say, oh, open core is just this like sort of natural evolution of open source and it's going to just replace open source. And shouldn't everything be open core because, you know, now everyone can make money and start companies and blah, blah, blah. I think that's like way oversimplified and just extremely naive. And, and blurry of, of a way of looking at the world. But I think you've you've touched on one of the main things that bothers me about the open core phrase, because at its origin, open core was coined as a way to differentiate 100% open source companies like uh, Red Hat and companies where only part of the technology was open source and then the business model relies on um, keeping some of the product yep. closed source and and so at its origin open core was a way to differentiate a certain type of company from open source and so your your evolution of the phrase is one that uh, kind of grates a little with me because a lot of the companies that you've mentioned i would not call them open core companies i would not call red hat an open core company or mysql or can, um, I, can I propose for an extension why I, I, I have been uh, uh, active, <laughs> quite active in trying to evolve the term, um, specifically open core, not open source. Uh, and again, going back to what Ray was saying, I think this is another opportunity to really re-emphasize. I have zero interest and in, furthermore, I think explicitly, I, I, I think that it's completely unnecessary to evolve the definition and the meaning of the term open source. Um, I think open source will stand the test of time for the next several decades. There's a lot of people who think open source needs to be redefined in a lot of contexts. I completely uh, disagree with that in, in every way, shape or form. I do believe though that the term open core can be evolved and uh, kind of retrofitted to support a more modern, helpful, and you know, I do believe beneficial and better narrative for how companies in general can be built. Companies in general, literally all companies. Um, when an entrepreneur sets, sets out to go and create a technology company, um, they make an explicit decision 
at some point in time, either at the origin or over time, to create a, an open core company versus a closed core company. I think it would be better for the world to have businesses and technologies that we rely on as humans uh, collectively when we use technology uh, that embody this kind of overall open core approach because we can build higher trust with those companies. We can better participate in the core technologies that make up those companies. And I think that all the other benefits that we're very, very well aware of can kind of materialize more, more, more easily. That's I have to do. Yeah. Um, does it bother you that many of the companies that you would categorize as open core reject that term and would consider it a pejorative description of them? I don't think it bothers me. I don't, I'm not on a, a you know, campaign to convince everyone to label themselves as open core. I, I just think okay. it's, it's a technically accurate term. Yeah. I um, just feel like it, I just feel like, like I have no heartburn with the word commercial open source software. Like I would even be fine with companies like Red Hat being bucketed in the same group of companies with open core companies under a banter, a banner of something like commercial open source software. I have no heartburn with that. I do have heartburn with open core because we already have other words, right? Like we have words like the open organization, all the work Jim Whitehurst did and all of that. Like, I agree with you that there is something special about those cultures and having open decision-making framework and doing things in an open way and transparent. And I think that is something that the world is learning how to organize itself better. Humans are learning, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think Snowflake probably does that just as well as a lot of other companies internally, even though they're a proprietary company. I'm still very skeptical that, the software license model under which they decide to license their software has any effect on how transparent or open their organizations are internally. I suspect, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, that that. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm a big fan of that book. I think open organizations are, are also orthogonal to everything we're talking about here, actually. So any organization can embrace those types of principles uh, without needing to be open core versus closed core. I think that's actually. But you did bring that up as an example of one of the things that makes them fundamentally to their core. No, you know, you know, mm -hmm. to quote. So but I will I give us for them the, to be more open organizationally. Uh, it's much more difficult to be closed organizationally when you're an open core company because such a large extent of the company is basically, you know, built as an open source technology, which you know explicitly and implicitly, uh, you know, uh, uh, unveils a huge amount of um, uh, transparency, uh, you know, as to the core, you know, development of the technology and you know basically everything. See, I don't think those are orthogonal. I don't, I still do. I don't think you even disproved it with those statements because you basically just repeat a bunch of words I said. Like, I agree. Transparency is important. That's critical. I think, I think honestly, it's a, it's a, a principle, if you will. It's, it goes beyond, you know, open source or open core or anything else. I mean, I just think it's a principle for humanity. Oh yeah. That's what I was saying. I agree. I agree. Any company can be open organizationally. They don't need to be open core versus closed core. I just think it's a lot easier and more natural uh, for open core companies to do so. I do not think that that's the fundamental like distinction and reason that open core companies are different. I think open core companies are different is because they exist because of a core open source technology also existing. Uh, and if you and said, if you, if those. you were to replace the word commercial open source company, everywhere you said open core, I would have had no disagreement with everything you said. I think those two terms are actually somewhat interchangeable. I, I, I use this cost acronym a lot because, um, like the, the SaaS acronym was invented when Salesforce was founded 20 years ago uh, to describe the type of company that they were building um, and now is used very fluidly in the industry. If you said SaaS in 2001, 2002, people would have thought, well, what do you mean? Like a sassy personality? Like, what are you talking about? It takes about 20 years for terms to become very fluid. I think we do need an acronym to describe open core companies, basically. And so I think OC is a little bit too difficult because like two letters and there's like Orange County in Southern California. So I think cost is just like more fluid. I do, I use those terms interchangeably though. For so I want to get us towards wrapping up. Um, I'm going to bundle two audience questions together. Um, Karsten asks, why not use a label that doesn't have the baggage of open core and some of that pejorative history? And Darren asks, is there enough awareness of the relationship between closed core and open core companies? My personal perspective on that is that there is not. Um, Ray, do you want to give your opinion uh, as, we, as we wrap this up? I'm not sure if I understand the second question, like relationship between closed core or it's, it's Darren asking more about contra contrasting so I, the culture I think, of the um, companies. Yeah. My understanding of it is like Joseph is making the distinction between open core as opposed to closed core, 
Whereas right. historically, my perception of it has been open core as opposed to open, 100% sure. open source. Um, right. And so is there enough awareness of this open core as opposed to closed core distinction? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, thanks for the context. I, I don't think there is because I mean, I just realized that while Joseph was talking like 10 minutes ago, like that, that sort of gave me a aha moment, like Joseph's actually talking more about how open core compares to like traditional proprietary software companies, right? It he wasn't necessarily making a distinction between because most of the debate is about like, which is better open source versus open core. But I mean, I think uh, what I learned today was that that's not, you know, how like where Joseph's head, head is like, if you know, if, if that, you know, that's sort of what I learned then in terms of, you know, why invent a, I mean, invent a new label, like, I mean, what's the point? Like, you know, I think if, if we invent a different term, like, I think it'll have just as much debate and, and baggage that we have today. Like, I'm not sure if that's, I mean, that's why I made a point earlier, like, you know, if, if it's that problematic and controversial, like, is it really helping anybody by using a term or even inventing a new one? But so, but, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a person that doesn't have, you know, doesn't put a lot of weight onto what, what something is called or a label. Like, you know, as I'm, I care more about the internals and the culture as opposed to what it's called. So. Yeah. And the business model, right? Yeah. Like what value is created yeah. for customers? Um, right. Joseph, right. do you want to, do you want to speak to these two questions? Yeah, I think um, it's very important to not compare open core to open source. Uh, I think it's also very important to not compare uh, open source to uh, closed core. I think closed core and open core are referring to something totally different, a type of company versus open source and uh, closed source are referring to something entirely different, which is a type of technology, specifically software source code technology, but could also be hardware over time, I think. So I think if you look at it from that standpoint, th there's a lot less confusion. Scott, do you want to wrap us up with a with a final thought on, I uh, you know, what uh, what were your perceptions coming in, and has any opinion been changed here, on uh, the relationship between open open core, closed core, open source? I, I <laughs> software and service. It's probably easier for me to answer the questions that they. <laughs> they okay, have. answer the questions. I, I I would say I would say words matter, and I I do have to say that we're we're going through things like removing the words master and slave from code. We're removing the words like blacklist and whitelist for a reason because they matter and they do have effect. I think I think not taking that in consideration is a little bit. I don't want to say insensitive or do a pejorative, but I will say it's like it's just a little bit. Uh, tone deaf just a little bit like to understand that there is history here and it definitely does have meaning to people already and i don't think it's just red hat i think there's a i talk to red hat customers all the time and i know there's a whole community of people that are sort of in the red hat camp if you will that are not just red hatters but there is a reason why buyers at different companies buy red hat stuff they do believe that we're doing it the right way in a lot of ways and they do feel like it protects them from being, uh, you know, I, I think if our code was open core, I, I, th I think that I think taking that word and trying to reuse it is tough. Like I just really do. Again, I have no heartburn with commercial open source software, but but I do have heartburn with trying. To, I'm with Ray in that. Like, is that useful? Is like, what is the point of trying to fight this battle? It doesn't make any sense to me. That's well, where. with that, I'd like to thank Ray, uh, Joseph, and Scott, uh, the three of you, for joining me today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's been a deep dive. We haven't entirely agreed, which was exactly what I expected when we were coming in. I don't know if any minds were changed listening to this, but certainly I understand better what you mean when you talk about open core. Um, so at least there's that. Um, so thank you all. I'll be getting this up on YouTube very shortly, and I will. Uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.